Initially, final girls were usually written as pure and virginal women who avoid sex and survive. But as the slasher genres evolve throughout the years, we have seen variations of the archetype. We've had numerous great examples from classics like Laurie Strode and Halloween to modern takes like Tree Gelbman from Happy Death Day. But there are cases when the slasher film may have been good, but its heroine was not. So with that in mind, I'm Ellie with What Culture here with great horror movies with annoying final girls. Eleanor in Truth or Die. Truth or Die is a 2012 British horror film about a group of teenagers invited to a secluded cabin. Savvy fans of the slasher subgenre immediately know nothing good is about to happen, and wouldn't you know it, the trip takes a turn for the worse. You see, Justin invited the group to find out who was responsible for a prank gone wrong that resulted in the death of his brother, Felix. As the story unfolds, we find out it was Eleanor who was to blame, and in doing so, indirectly caused the events of the movie. Eleanor coerced Felix into performing oral sex on her passed out boyfriend and blackmailed him with the footage. This led to the young man committing suicide, though he's later revealed to have survived this attempt. Now, any rational human being would understand why Justin did what he did, but what makes this worse is that Eleanor wins by the end of Truth or Die. Eleanor never faces real consequences for her actions, which have cost the lives of her friends, and she even kills both Justin and Felix. Because of this, many horror fans find Eleanor annoying and one of the most undeserving final girls out there. Alice Johnson in A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 The Dream Master A Nightmare on Elm Street 4 The Dream Master continues where its predecessor, Dream Warriors, left off. But one thing it drops the ball on compared to previous Elm Street films is with its protagonist. Alice Johnson, played by Lisa Wilcox, is a quiet young girl who daydreams all the time. She then becomes the titular dream master when Kristen Parker passes her powers to her and turns Alice into Freddy Krueger's most formidable foe. As the movie progresses, Alice becomes more powerful as she gains new abilities from her fallen friends. By the end of the picture, she has received Kristen's ability to drag people into dreams, Sheila's intelligence, Rick's martial arts, and more. The Dream Master then defeats Freddy for good. Well, until he inevitably returns in the next movie, A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. The problem with Alice is that she is essentially a blank at the start of the movie and only gains traits once her friends start getting picked off. Everything notable about her, including the mental strength she gains, comes from her friends and this makes her somewhat of a leech. Thankfully, The Dream Child would improve the characterization of Alice. Alison Nelson in Halloween Ends Alison Nelson is one of the main protagonists in David Gordon Green's Halloween trilogy. As the granddaughter of Laurie Strode, the character is the descendant of horror royalty, and this had much to prove to fans of the genre. Thankfully, Alison is charming and likeable thanks to the writing and to Andy Matichak's performance. But with every subsequent entry in this trilogy, the characterization of Alison becomes worse, and by Halloween Ends, she becomes flat out annoying. In Halloween Ends, Alison spends the majority of the film disagreeing with her grandmother to the point where she blames her for the events of the previous films. Alison also ignores Laurie's warnings and starts an ill-fated romance with Corey in a relationship that takes up a huge chunk of the movie's runtime. Because an edgy love story is what Halloween fans want to see in the grand finale, right? Ultimately, Laurie is proven right when Corey becomes unhinged by the middle of Halloween ends and starts his own killing spree. But worse than killing the residents of Haddonfield, the writers of Halloween Ends managed to assassinate a character, Alison, who was initially worth rooting for. Rocky in Don't Breathe One of the biggest talking points of Don't Breathe is the question of who the audience was supposed to root for. Our initial trio of characters, Rocky, Alex and Money, are burglars who attempt to rob blind war veteran Norman Nordstrom of the money he was awarded after the death of his daughter. Referred to as simply the blind man in the film's credits, Norman turns out to be more dangerous than thought, leaving moviegoers to question whether his actions in the movie were justified or not. Of the group of burglars, Rocky is the only one who survives the events of Don't Breathe, though she is responsible for some questionable actions. Firstly, Rocky is complicit in the robbery, and while she has a sympathetic backstory, stealing from a blind man is still pretty low. When things eventually go wrong, she also turns down Alex's offer to call the police because this would mean losing the money they stole. Finally, Don't Breathe gives a definitive answer of who to root for, when the blind man is revealed to have held a woman named Cindy, who caused the death of Norman's daughter captive and has sexually assaulted and impregnated her. In an act of kindness, Rocky tries to rescue the woman, but her actions cause Cindy to be killed anyway. Alice Hardy in Friday the 13th 
Friday the 13th may be a horror classic, but one controversial opinion about the movie is that the final girl, Alice Hardy, isn't very good. Though the character has developed a fan base, she may be one of the most overrated final girls in the slasher subgenre. A big reason for this is that the character never really makes an impact throughout the first Friday the 13th film. Though we do get a subversion of the final girl trope with her implied affair with Steve Christie, Alice doesn't do much for most of the running time, while characters like Jack and Marcy end up standing out more. Our poor final girl, on the other hand, has thrilling scenes like an extended sequence of making coffee. Alice really just comes around by the time she's the last one standing and Mrs Voorhees is revealed to be the killer. But even then, our heroine frustratingly fumbles her defence and drops her weapons twice rather than finishing off the murderer. Alice does finally get lucky though as she picks up a machete and chops Pamela Voorhees' head off. Thankfully, the series would get better final girls with the Friday the 13th sequels. Sally in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Sally Hardesty and her friends encountered the Sawyer family in the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where most of the group were killed in brutal ways. Our heroine, however, would manage to make it through the terrible ordeal and become the film's final girl. Because the 1974 Texas Chainsaw Massacre was released before slasher movies would truly become popular, Sally is written differently compared to future final girls of the subgenre. For starters, we never really know a lot about her, and she serves more of an audience avatar, especially towards the horrors that occur later during the film's climax. This can be off-putting for those used to seeing Final Girls as strong survivors. And while most examples of the Final Girl fight and outsmart their villains, Sally is more of a reactionary character who endures the abuse she receives from the Sawyer family. She spends the rest of the film screaming her head off and losing her mind in the process. Of course, this isn't the fault of actress Marilyn Burns, who did a fine job portraying Sally, but many slasher fans might be annoyed with how Sally is written overall. Dina in Fear Street Part 1, 1994 The Fear Street trilogy is the Netflix adaptation of the popular R. L. Stein horror books. All three films are entertaining and a great homage to horror movies of the past. But for the first picture, Fear Street Part 1 1994, a big point of criticism is its divisive protagonist, Dina. The character displays toxic behaviour towards her ex, Sam, from guilt-tripping her to forcing her to come out as a lesbian. And while Dina's mood stems from being understandably heartbroken from a breakup, it doesn't excuse her for causing a car crash that injures the woman she supposedly loves. When the threat of the film comes for Sam, Dina is extremely motivated to protect her, even at the expense of her younger brother and her two friends. In fact, by the end of Fear Street Part 1, Dina's friends have been killed, yet Dina never mourns them. Instead, everything seems alright with her as long as she has Sam alive and well. Thankfully, Dina is not the protagonist for Part 2, and she's also much better written and likeable as a character by the time of Part 3. Julie in I Know What You Did Last Summer when it comes to the Scream-inspired slashes of the second half of the 90s, I Know What You Did Last Summer remains the most recognisable out there. Starring Jennifer Love Hewitt, Sarah Michelle Gellar, Ryan Philippe and Freddie Prince Jr., the movie was a hit and even spawned two sequels. But unlike the Scream movies, Last Summer did not have a great final girl. Here, Julie James serves as the main heroine but is considered by slasher aficionados as annoying throughout the first film. This is largely due to Julie acting all high and mighty, despite being complicit in dumping the body of a man she and her friends accidentally killed. Jennifer Love Hewitt does her best with the role, but the limited writing makes her character hard to root for. And by the film's third act, Julie is unfortunately turned into a damsel in distress who does nothing but scream, while Prince Jr.'s Ray is the one who saves the day. Ultimately, many fans of I Know What You Did Last Summer would have preferred Sarah Michelle Gellar's Helen Shivers to have survived instead of Julie. Kate in Army of the Dead Zack Snyder returned to the zombie genre with 2021's Army of the Dead. Though most of the film is a fun and entertaining romp, many fans agree that if there was one sore spot in the movie, it would be Kate Ward. The character is the daughter of protagonist Scott Ward, but while our hero is devoted to his daughter, audiences did not share the same sentiment. In an attempt to rescue her friend Geeta, Kate tells her dad that she'll be accompanying the team. If he says otherwise, she'll sneak in anyway. Kate, of course, eventually abandons the group, despite the threat of a nuclear launch on Las Vegas. This forces Scott and his ally Peters to go look for the young woman, which gets them killed by the end of Army of the Dead. What makes it worse is that Geeta, the person Kate was trying to rescue this entire time, dies during a helicopter crash, making Kate's quest entirely pointless. 
In a sea of heroes, villains, rogues and colourful characters, Army of the Dead makes the worst mistake by making the most annoying character its final girl. Noriko in Battle Royale Battle Royale is a highly influential Japanese film and the precursor to The Hunger Games. The movie is filled with a colourful cast of characters, all of whom have well-written backstories and motivations. One of the principal figures is Noriko Nakagawa, who serves as our final girl. But in a film filled with memorable heroes and villains, our heroine, along with the male lead Shuya, often feel plain compared to their more interesting classmates. It doesn't help that our final girl isn't given enough screen time for her backstory and as a result she often feels underdeveloped. Sure, Noriko has the traditional qualities of a final girl, like being innocent and pure, but while other examples of the trope are strong female leads, Noriko is more of a damsel rather than an active character. The males, including the villainous Kitano, all exist to protect her, and because of this a lot of fans feel like Noriko does not deserve to survive the events of Battle Royale. Even by the time she finally grows a spine and kills Kitano, many would claim Noriko's development was a little too late. Mandy Lane in All the Boys Love Mandy Lane Despite being a dark inversion of the final girl trope, Mandy Lane still manages to be a bit of an eye roller. For the first half of the film, the weirdly oblivious Mandy seems to saunter comfortably through life without putting much thought into the drooling men obsessing over her everywhere she goes. She says little of interest and, if it wasn't for her name being in the title, could almost be dismissed as a borderline object of lust for the horny teenage boys that populate much of the cast. Needless to say, her weekend getaway with some other high schoolers quickly descends into murder mayhem. It turns out Mandy's old friend and all-round social outcast Emmett has had enough of seemingly everything and is now killing everyone off for rejecting him. In the kind of surprise twist that's often not that surprising these days, Mandy's actually in league with him and better still is the real mastermind behind the whole thing. The shift in character and arc is a bit jarring to say the least here, as is Amber Heard's struggle to really get the evil aggressive side of her character across effectively. The ending scenes of her getting away with it all, which were clearly meant to be chilling on paper, just come out a bit hollow in practice thanks to rather half-baked character development and plotting in an otherwise suspenseful film. Prissy in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning it's amazing how much mayhem Chrissy manages to sidestep in this critically canned but wildly entertaining prequel compared to her boyfriend and buddies. There's a few excuses provided in this film as to why Jordana Brewster's one-dimensional lead character doesn't suffer meat hooks, beatings, flayings and teeth removals like her friends. All of them really just serve as filler to move this maddened showcase of Arlie Ermey's scary acting chops along at a quick suspenseful pace. Initially sent flying after a car crash due to an altercation with a biker, she manages to miss Ermie's crazy Charlie Hewitt Jr. rocking up to the scene for some murderous mayhem. When everyone else gets stuck in this house of a lengthy round of increasingly sick torture and torment, Chrissy winds up befriending one of the bikers from earlier who agrees to investigate the situation. When Chrissy's boyfriend gets maimed beyond belief, she just sort of sits around quietly waiting for Leatherface to come back and finish the job. As oddly thrilling as this underrated entry in the long-running franchise is, its lack of development in regards to Chrissy ultimately hinders some of the dramatic stakes when she becomes the final girl. As shocking as her surprise death at the hands of a backseat driver Leatherface is, it's not particularly impactful emotionally which slightly hinders the otherwise well-executed climax. Sam Carpenter in Scream Billy Loomis, the big bad of the original film whose diabolical antics were horribly undercut by a retcon in Scream 3, now has a surprise kid who's all grown up and back in Woodsboro as a new slate of ghostface killings kick off. It's barely even allowed the room to be a plot twist before discount Randy reveals this new killing spree is a requel, a rehash sequel that just repeats everything from the original. It's something that many cinema goers have been expressing dissatisfaction with lately. While the satire of the requel format is on point here, the Billy plotline doesn't do much to make Sam a compelling or easy to root for lead like Sidney Prescott was in the earlier films. The borderline convoluted story threads that allow her boyfriend Richie to be one of the killers also doesn't quite pack the punch of the Billy reveal from the original film. Actress Melissa Barrera did a fine job with the material, but the lack of originality ultimately hindered this long-awaited sequel. Victoria Hayes in Terrifier 
On one hand, it's pretty easy to feel sorry for poor Victoria's bowel-twisting conclusion in Terrifier. Let's not even get started on the second one. Not only does most of her face get killed off, but she also loses her sister and mind before the end credits roll. As unfortunate as all of that is, it doesn't change the fact that she spends much of the first film running around screaming aimlessly. In fact, for much of the film's runtime, it's safe to say her older sister Tara is the superior character both in development and story. In Victoria's case, she had one job to do, bring Tara and Dawn home. Instead, like so many folks who inexplicably lose all common sense and reason when in danger in a horror movie, Vicky's easily lured into a spooky basement by the monstrous Art the Clown. When she later has the chance to escape Art's clutches, she spots her sister's corpse and pauses to do a whole lot of not hugely convincing grieving. Obviously, the loss of a sibling is devastating, but it's just infuriating watching her hold up for so long despite needing to run for her life. Her stupidity and adherence to the gaps in logic that seem almost required of horror characters cost her most of her face due to Art being peckish. The face munching's a suitably revolting moment in this splatter-heavy nightmare fuel of a film, and much of it could have been avoided had Victoria used the magic of common sense. Michelle in The Burning this cult classic slasher was very unsubtly modelled on the Cropsey legends from New York in the 70s. Cropsey, an escaped mental patient and child abductor as per the legends, was warned of in campfire stories everywhere. In The Burning, a hapless caretaker named Cropsey, because the missing E really makes a difference, is left horribly disfigured after a, well, burning takes place in his cabin. By the time the key cast of many soon-to-be victims arrive at Camp Blackfoot, Cropsey's fully embraced life as a murdering maniac to cope with his general rage over his unfortunate disaster years earlier. With Final Girl Michelle, we discover what might actually be the best way to survive a slasher's rampage. Just don't get involved. Upon discovering a litany of the bodies Cropsey's left behind, Michelle heads back to camp to call the police. It is, of course, a logical thing to do, but it also leads to her completely sidestepping the climax of the film and having zero involvement in Cropsey's defeat. She just pops up with the cops in hand the moment he's gone. Not like they're even useful now that civilians took matters into their own hands. Actress Leah Ayres does a passable job in the role, and the character's inoffensive for the most part. However, her penchant for finding Cropsey's crime crime scenes gets tiresome and her lack of participation in the third act almost makes her survival feel unearned by slasher movie standards. Laurie Campbell in Freddy vs Jason after more than a decade of rumours and delays, Freddy Krueger finally got to meet Jason Voorhees in one of the campiest films of either Monstrous Killer's filmography. When it comes to the camp factor, look no further than Final Girl Laurie Campbell. Actress Monica Keener's reactions and facial expressions are often ridiculously over the top, as is the character's surprise knack for getting the better of Mr. Krueger. Bizarrely, when Laurie's reactions aren't overblown, her general delivery is rather wooden. In a film already let down by picking one of the worst scripts among the the many Freddy vs Jason drafts out there, the fact that Jason showcases a more convincing range of emotions than a leading star might just take the cake. If there's one thing that can be said in Laurie's favour, she does at least get Freddy into the real world. They're crazy, but apparently less evil since the film very conveniently gives the humans an excuse to help him, Jason finally hands Freddy the whooping he's always deserved. Well, almost. Despite the film being called Freddy vs Jason, Laurie gets the honours of removing Freddy's head from his body. That's right, not Jason, not one half of the showdown people paid to see. No, Laurie gets that big moment. Justine Fielding in Tormented even most of the characters in this British, darkly comedic take on the genre seem to find head girl Justine Fielding a bit much. It's first noticeable during her eulogy of a deceased student she doesn't even seem to know existed. Despite presenting herself as a straight-laced, morally upright figure, Justine's overjoyed when the school's in crowd, a crew of psychopathic pupils notorious for their bullying and general nastiness, extend her an olive branch. Her five days of attempting to be in with the cool kids goes pretty horribly wrong on all levels as the ghost of a boy they bullied wreaks murderous havoc. By design, most of the figures in this movie are comically unlikable, coming off as a parody of both US high school stereotypes and British teen shows such as Skins, Tormented is very much in the Larry David camp of providing the viewer unsympathetic protagonists who never learn their lesson. The problem with Justine is she's positioned to be the exception to that rule, but in order to remain relevant to the plot, has to rub elbows with the rest of the detestable cast. It's a fine line that doesn't quite pan out as the awkward romance with pop 
popular guy Alex manages to somehow be both rushed and plodding due to odd pacing. In the end, after a series of ridiculous murders of one note, one dimensional characters, Justine getting framed for their death seems much funnier than it should be, even if this film often meant for a jokey touch. Blair Lily in Unfriended Sometimes the final girl's just plain unlikable by design. Look no further than Blair Lily, the oddly diabolical lead of this internet age take on the slasher flick. Blair's old friend slash enemy, Laura Barnes, committed suicide following the release of a supremely embarrassing drunken video in which she does potty time in her sleep at a party. From there, we catch up with Blair, her boyfriend, and some other so-called friends via a Skype group chat. Needless to say, the spirit of Laura's determined to ruin their evening. Bar the curious group chat set up, the narrative follows many of the tropes from the slasher genre to the letter, namely the steadily piling deaths of the teenage cast played by adults. We discover a variety of unfortunate facts about Blair, from cheating on her boyfriend and stealing and crashing her friend's mum's car, to filming that unfortunate defecation video of Laura. To top it all off, she tries to move the blame of the video onto someone else, all while her friends and boyfriend die in increasingly sadistic fashion. By the time she's the final girl, it's hard to really get invested in her potential survival. Between the miserable, often petty character arc and the shrill delivery of much of her dialogue, Blair's both annoying and despicable. The girl slash princess gemstone in Laid to Rest. If there's one thing Laid to Rest gets right, it's the villain. Chrome Skull is a surprisingly effective and engaging killer from which much of this film's entertainment value is born. If there's one thing that Laid to Rest gets wrong, it's the final girl. Princess Gemstone's on the run for much of the movie, constantly getting chased by the crazed Chrome Skull from one murder stuff location to the next. In amongst all the tense sequences and chases though, is next to no effort in regards to developing Princess as an even vaguely three-dimensional character. Worse still, even if the writers had taken the time to flesh her out a bit more, it likely would have been for naught. Actress Bobby Sue Luther just doesn't seem to be all that into realistic acting, instead opting for increasingly grating screaming every time that no good chrome skull shows up. Bizarrely, the considerably more acclaimed and famous Lena Headey was in this as well for a painfully brief showing. Considering her track record of more nuanced, versatile performances over the years, it's curious the folks in charge didn't opt to try and switch the two stars around, as it stands. Hands, Princess Gemstone lets down an otherwise surprisingly solid low-budget slasher flick. Natalie, Birdemic, Shock and Terror James Nunion's infamous romantic horror about an army of killer birds with acidic blood was gripping, terrifying, and wrapped up with a plethora of immersive visuals. Okay, so maybe it's not the best film ever made. However, even in a movie ranked as the fifth worst of all time according to IMDb, Final Girl Natalie manages to stand out as a real low point. Wooden and whiny are not the best qualities for a horror movie Final Girl, but there are few out there who nail both of these traits quite like Natalie. An apparent lingerie model who supposedly the gig of a lifetime with Victoria's Secret, Natalie goes throughout the entire film either delivering out of place lines, complaining about something, or going the complete opposite way and being this unstoppable force of positivity when it couldn't be more obvious that this isn't the time for it. Whitney Moore portrays Natalie in both Birdemic Shock and Terror and its sequel Birdemic Resurrection, though undoubtedly very few people have managed to stomach her in both performances. Rios, The Descent Part 2 one of the biggest reasons why The Descent was such a great entry into the horror genre was its all-female cast. Every single member of the group of friends who delved deep into the North Carolina mountains was both likeable and extremely resourceful, with all of them being given enough screen time to show off their personalities and convey these things naturally. And while the sequel does try to recapture a lot of that magic by bringing back the two main characters from the group in Sarah and Juno, it falls flat on its face when it comes to the likes of Ellen Rios, technically the film's final girl. Introduced as a local sheriff deputy who joins up with the next batch of would-be crawler victims, Rios has very little going for her in terms of development and only really exists in the film as someone Sarah can lead around and explain what's going on to. She absolutely disappears when she's next to the two final girls from the original, and the fact she's the last one standing out of the entire group is genuinely staggering. The Descent Part 2's ending might be controversial for horror fans, but seeing Rios tossed back to the crawlers at the end is certainly a moment most audiences can absolutely get behind. Michelle. Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3 
Out of all the films in the Texas Chainsaw series, the third entry might just be the most forgettable one going. It doesn't have the low budget documentary style of the original, the gloss of the Leatherface prequel, or the dark comedy of Texas Chainsaw 2. It doesn't even have the insanity of the next generation to keep us at least interested. It's literally just another charmless look at the depravity of Leatherface and the Sawyer family. Sadly, its characters are also some of the most forgettable in the series as well, with final girl Michelle coming in as one of the worst of these. Introduced as being stuck up and disloyal to her boyfriend, Michelle is is constantly moaning as her road trip through the Texan countryside begins to go wrong. She goes from whiny to disappearing altogether when the real hero of the film, Benny, turns up. Michelle is pretty much just a character the writers can use to put through the usual dosage of misery and torture that all the films in the series end up relying on. There's not a lot going on with Michelle to root for to begin with, and certainly no arc or development to be seen in the film that will make audiences want to root for her, rather than Leatherface and co. Angela Vidal, Quarantine. Wreck was a 2007 Spanish film that helped revitalise the found footage subgenre. Tense, terrifying, and filled with charismatic characters, it established a legacy as one of the finest releases of its time, spawned its very own franchise, and in quarantine, its very own remake as well, for better or worse. Some of Wreck's co writers openly expressed their displeasure at just how much of a rip off quarantine was of the original. The fact that the film's final girl, Angela Vidal, is another reporter exploring an apartment building filled with people infected with a strange strand of rabies just goes to show how how far the similarities stretch. Unfortunately for Quarantine, the only thing it manages to stand out with against the original is just how bland of a character its lead really is. Angela is one of those final girls who offers next to nothing constructive to the team during the runtime, but does at least boast an infuriating amount of time breathing down the camera and then screaming like a hapless damsel in distress. Nancy Holbrook, A Nightmare on Elm Street. The 2010 remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street was released during the peak of the horror movie remake craze and is easily one of the worst examples of it at work. Jackie Earl Haley gives it his all as Freddy, but the darker tone and rehashing of all the things the original did perfectly fine in the first place just make this film feel unnecessary more than anything else. The OG Nancy Thompson might just be one of the best final girls of all time. However, her replacement, Rooney Mara's Nancy Holbrook, is about as far away as it gets to being among the best. In this version of Nightmare, Nancy has gone from likeable, resourceful and competent to literally the opposite of all these things, broody and constantly banging on about how she doesn't fit in anywhere. Nancy is led through all the film's developments first by Jesse, then Quentin, and barely goes through anything resembling development over the course of the film. Donna Keppel, Prom Night. A wannabe remake of the 1980 classic, Prom Night is the story of a young woman named Donna Keppel who is hunted down by her former teacher, a man named Richard Fenton, years after he had become obsessed with her and murdered her entire family. Britney Snow plays the final girl, but her performance really crowns off a film that feels far more like a teen drama than an outright bloody slasher flick. The whole film is filled to the brim with Donna turning around and crying and complaining, two traits audiences would expect to see in one of the first victims to get the chop, and not the main hero to follow for the story. The original Prom Night is renowned for its pretty dull story, but its remake really manages to push this to a new level of snorefest. The PG-13 rating for this film certainly doesn't help sell the tension of the situation, which only makes the constant crying coming from Donna all the more infuriating to see throughout the runtime. On top of all of this, Donna doesn't even manage to sandwich in a victory over her own stalker in the film, with Idris Elba's detective win stealing that honour during the film's finale. Sarah Moya, Halloween Resurrection. Killing off one of the most accomplished actors to ever appear in the franchise, and the best final girl during its run in the opening 10 minutes, doesn't put Halloween Resurrection in the best starting spot. But Laurie Strode's replacement, Sarah Moyer, really helps hammer the nail into its coffin. Portrayed by Bianca Kajlik in the 2002 disaster of a movie, Sarah is the only female university student to survive the Michael Myers reality show, and is again just another character the writers want everyone to think is edgy and different to everyone else. There are subtler and more interesting ways for a screen writer to do that other than just have a character mop their hair in front of their face, give the odd weird expression, retorted remark, or just spend the entire film looking really sad, but sadly that memo didn't seem to reach Resurrections writers. Halloween Resurrection is one of the best examples of Hollywood's love for pointless sequels in full effect, and Sarah's character does absolutely nothing to justify things either. Bridget, Leprechaun 2. Most of the final girls from the Leprechaun series could have a shot at making their way onto this list. Such is the quality of writing on show in the franchise, but there's just something so undeniably irritating about everything in Leprechaun 2 that it edges out all other competition. The film responsible for pushing the franchise direct to video, Leprechaun 2 doesn't have any of the so bad it's good comedy or wacky storylines and settings that the franchise would become known for, just the exact same plot as the original. And they don't come more detestable than Bridget, the film's final girl who sadly manages to 
survive the little green tearaway. Introduced as a whiny girlfriend who sabotages her boyfriend's job because he had to cancel their date due to work, Bridget then leaves said boyfriend that very night for literally the first man that looked to her is then captured by Leprechaun, fails to escape twice, then jumps back to her boyfriend when he rescues them as if nothing ever happened. It's rare to find selfish, mean, and helpless all in the same final girl, but by god does Bridget in Leprechaun 2 manage to do it.